I know you guys love your Arduino Unos and, of course, the Arduino Nano, which in fact is only a smaller form factor of that. And for, say, the ESP series, let's put on a, what's this thing? A Note MCU, this thing is called. You you probably have heard of that. This is an ESP8266 on a breakout, breakout board. And you know me, I'm more into naked chips. So, like these little things. This is an 80 tiny 85 We talked about this a lot on this channel. And, um, yeah, I think I've Richard infected with this now. He's going for 85, 80 tinies, 85s all the time. Between naked chips and these big hulking breakout boards, there are more breakout boards out there. So um, I have a selection of them here. Let's talk about them. So just for your information, this isn't a build episode. We won't do software, we won't do hardware here. So this is just showing you guys what's available out there. And this is only a fraction of what's really available out there. And to keep things interesting, well, interesting for me, you guys can decide on which board we're going to build a project next time. So please put it in the comments, well, after watching this video, of course, but put it in the comments what could be an interesting choice to do a hardware design next time, and I'll try to figure out to build something with it. Well, let's get to the boards. For the moment, let's stick in the Mega 328 family of CPUs. So this is closely related to the Arduino thing here. Hello Arduino Pro Mini. Yeah, this is an original Arduino design and if you look close, well, you see uh, there's a 328 Atom Mega on there. So same CPU as you're on your Uno or your Nano. These little boards are packed with holes. They have all the connections you find on a Nano or a Uno somewhere around here. But wait a second, where is the USB port? You guessed it right. There is no USB port. And if I turn this board around, let's try to see. Is there's no hidden chip on here. So, where, how do I program these little things? Whoever just said serial adapter, right? You use a serial adapter to program these little things. Um, but of course, there's a catch. For once, you're blocking the serial ports. You can't do anything without the serial ports. You need them. Of course, you can go the ICSP road with a different adapter because you need to program this ICSP. If you use ICSP for programming, you're going to need four pins. And while you're designing this, you have to be sure that these pins don't get to levels that won't work with program programming them. And there's another catch. Look at this. The top rows here are where the serial connectors go in. And if you look close, TX, RX, VCC, GND on this one and... GND, VCC, RXI, TXO on that one, plus RAW, and this has got DX. Don't ask me what this is. Yeah, these are Chinese clones, of course they are. And sometimes the Chinese mess up with their connections. So you, go, you are going to have loads of fun with the clones to figure out which way your serial port is connected. Yeah, this is doable, but... It isn't nice. Why don't I buy original Arduino stuff? Well, because it's too expensive. If I can get 10 clones for one real Arduino, well, I go for the 10 clones. Yeah, I know this isn't nice, and I love Arduino for what they do for the community, but guys, get at your prices. All right, next one coming up. Okay, isn't this a classic Nano? No, you're wrong, Jan Padovan. Let me pull this down here because I can't remember these numbers. This is an LG T8F328P. What the heck? Well, the 328P gives it away. This is a clone of a Atomega 328P. So the thing that is on a Nano or a Arduino Uno board. But this is a modified version. This CPU can simply clock higher. It's double the speed of a normal Nano or, say, um, Arduino Uno. Did I ever use this? Not really. I haven't really played around with these. These are something that lay in my back. And when I get to a point where I need more CPU power on a Nano or an Arduino Uno, I tend to go for a different CPU type. I simply go for an ESP something something because uh, I get so much more CPU speed on that. So these are more, well, they are there. I never tried to tease that out. But now you know that they are there. 
This is the first port we see that doesn't use an ATI Mega 328. In fact, this uses an ATI Tiny. Ha <laughs> ha, we know these. And, and it, this is a ATI Tiny 167 board. I'll put this on here so you have an idea what this is. And you see it's DigiSpark Pro, so DigiSpark came up with a design here and they did a clever thing here because if you look close you don't see a USB to serial converter. There's none. On the little chip there is a bootloader stored. This is called Micronucleus. I probably say this wrong. This little piece of code emulates a USB port for I think 5 seconds or something while it's booting. After this, it gives control to the normal running program. But until then, it simply emulates a USB port on defined pins. So to program this little thing, you unplug it from your computer, start your programmer IDE, Arduino IDE, of course, and when it's done compiling, it will tell you, plug in the system now, you plug it in, it detects this, and programs your new firmware. Sounds a bit strange? It is, believe me. But this is doable and this works surprisingly well. When do you need these boards? Tricky. There's no real reason nowadays to use these. Um, there's not much CPU power in there. I think it's 16 megahertz. And since they're getting very exotic, they tend to get expensive. We don't want expensive. We want it to stay on the cheap side. So this is more a thing. You have seen this now. You know that it's out there. Let's go on. And here we are back with an old friend of us, uh, the AT Tiny 85. Yeah, it's an AT Tiny 85. Sally, this is this little thing there, not the power regulator, or this little thing over here. And as you can see, these ports have USB ports directly on it, or um, micro USB on this little one here. But again, where is the serial to USB chip? Just like at the DigiSpark Pro. There is no serial adapter. This thing uses micronucleus too. I'm still saying this wrong, I guess. So to program this, you unplug it from the computer, start your compiler, and if it's done, it tells you, now plug in the device. You plug in the device, micronucleus emulates a USB port for a short time, and it just recognizes this and programs it. And of course, there's a downside. Got to see original DigiSpark design here. So uh, this is everything. This is really not much going on here. Some USB with some protection circuit on it. There's a CPU. There's a pin header. Some voltage regulation. Because you can feed this more than 5 volts. There's a regulator on it. The downside is pin PB4 and PB3 are used for USB programming. So this part over here is USB. Then there's an LED on this. So this uses PB1 which leaves us with PB0 and PB2 to do anything. PB5 is the reset line, and you don't want to mess with it. Believe me, you don't. Why is this a problem? Imagine you're putting something like an LED or something on this line here, PB3, that goes to the USB port. Trying to program this now won't work, because the LED will probably mess up your USB signals. Yeah, you're in a pickle here. But these little buggers have an ass up their sleeve. Not an ass, you know, ass like in the card games. Get your mind out of the gutter, please. They can emulate a mouse or a keyboard to the PC they are connected to. And just thinking about this brings a whole lot of possibilities with it. With very interesting results. By the way, this is a base of one of the upcoming Devious Devices series. So stay tuned what you can do with these little bastards. Okay, up to the next one. We're leaving the Atmel chips now and going over to Espressive Terrain. And I, of course I start with the 8266, which is, by the way, a great, great chip. And now this isn't the chip you see in here. This, in fact, is a module. ESP12 module. Well, excuse my handwriting. You know, left-handed in it and stuff. And I really, really like this little module because the design of the antenna is already done. Yeah, of course, you can do this by yourself. You can draw some traces on your board, but I'll bet you that you have to try this out. You have to try out the antenna, and this will take loads of iterations, loads of testing boards until you get this right. So if I use an ESP, a semi-naked ESP here, I normally go for these boards because everything's on there. I have to, don't have to care about how the antenna design. This works. What you have to do when you're designing something with that 
under the antenna here, oh, sorry for the focus, under the antenna, you don't want to have any copper. So if you design something with this little chip, you never put something under these antenna areas. So leave this out, don't do a copper fill under this, or simply do a cutout in the board, because you don't want to have anything around there. Elseways, they work great. But wait, how do we program them? Well, two ways to do the programming. First, you can do in-circuit, of course. Simply put your RXTX somewhere, then this is GPL0 must be held down while pressing reset, and then you are in boot mode, and then you can, can upload your code, simply from the Arduino IDE. Or, if you don't want to do that, that's where these things come in handy. I think I need to tilt this a bit, so you guys can see what this does. This is a placeholder in here, so to, you drop this little chip in here. Let me try to do this under the camera. Press it down, and now it sits flat on the board. And then I have my USB port, I have my boot and reset button, I have a power switch, I even can program an ESP01, which comes next, I think, in here. So these things are quite handy to program them. And you, of course, you have all the pins broken out there. Talking about ESP01s, here's one. A really, really tiny board, antenna over there. This is a flash ROM, over here is a little GPU. And you see, this comes, comes out with only eight pins. So you don't have so many I.O. in here. In fact, you have, say, three and a half I.O.s in here. Yeah, I know, this is marketed with one or two GPUs. Well, you could use three and a half. Believe me, you can. We can do a project about this. And if you want to program this, you simply get it into this socket here. I have to look beside the camera. And now I can program this little one. If you know you're only playing around with the ESPs or ones and you don't want to go for the naked modules right before, you could use this programmer. Yeah, this little programmer has a socket. I simply drop the little board in here. And now I can program this. I don't even have to press some reset button because this is all the reset logic on the little board. Very neat. And as added feature, you see the pin rows over here. So you can measure everything with the just built logic analyzer we did in the last video, right? So this is normally my go-to setup when I'm programming these little ESPs or ones because um, great stuff. You don't need much more for that. But what can you do with an ESP01? Because low GPU count, right? Let's have a look. Lots of people pick it up on these little ones and they build something like shields you get for an Arduino Uno. For example, if you want to measure something of the environment, there's say, I think, temperature and probably humidity sensor. Or since we have a GPIO left over here, we could use things like that. This is a relay and, you know, this only needs one GPIO. So if you have a simple switching solution that you want to Wi-Fi it, that's the way to go. You simply use this little one, and these costs around a euro a piece. So uh, this is a really, really cheap way to do these. There are lots more of these extensions available. I don't have so many of them lying around. But this is a great way to switch something or to measure something. And well, if you need some tiny weather station, this is what you, what you use. While in the ESP8266 subsystem, this is probably the most common known thing here. This is a Wemos D1 Mini. The board simply breaks out all the pins the little module has. Yeah, I know these pins are never connected because they are internal communication with the flash ROM. So don't go there. And on the back side, you normally find something like this. This is a classic serial to USB converter. There is some voltage regulation somewhere, some transistors you need to do the boot cycle, and Bob's your uncle. Here you go. This is a complete subsystem ready to use. D1s come in different shapes and sizes, just like we humans do. And um, here's one with a better antenna. Here's one without with a chip directly on the board. Um, these do all the same. They have all the same pin out, which is very handy. And because they have all the same pin out, a big subsystem develop, developed around these boards. Let me show you. For example, you can get a relay module that's just the same as we saw with the little ESP01. Or you can get a battery powered module. This has a charging circuit. You can get a little display here 
real-time clock modules. If you want to extend your bus, bus lines to more, more modules, you can use a thing like that. It's a simple sea of holes. Or use a two-way connector. Or if you have a really big circuit, go three-way. We actually used these modules in the university in Düsseldorf when I worked. Because they were so easy to use. You simply do a stack of them and you get them together here and you do a baseboard for them with the rest of the electronics. And this is really, really handy, really good to use. So this is probably the most versatile application for an ESP8266. So another ESP8266 board. We have some... Um, flash ROM, the, the controller, and this is probably the USB to serial adapter that you normally use. But this one has an added feature. There's a battery holder on the back side and you can put in a little LiPo battery here. If you wanted something small and uh, battery powered, there's your way for that. You don't need a big 18650 for that. These teeny tiny 16340 are perfectly fine for powering such a system talking displays. Here's a little display module with a CPU on its, on its back. Flash memory, ESP8266, some USB to serial converter, and you're done. This is all you need to have a display module laying around. Downside I found with these modules. Firstly, it's a Chinese design, so getting a good data sheet from them is sometimes a real stroke of luck. Secondly, we bought some back in the universities of these and we had a problem with the layout. The little button over here for the GPO0 wasn't connected. So you could get something with really design errors on them. No guarantees there. But if you need something compact that has a little display on here, this is a monochrome OLED display. Yeah, this is the way to go. And before we head over to the ESP32 series, here's a design I really, really like. This little thing is called a witty, yeah, like a witty board. And it is, in fact. You have the obvious ESP8266 module on here. You have an LDR, a light-dependent resistor on here. You have an RGB LED on here. And on the front, there's some button. Button. This is all you get here. But this is a learning module. You can unplug the upper side from the lower side. The lower side holds the interface for USB connection to serial. And on the upper side, you only have the naked chip here. Why I like them so much? This is great for learning. With this, you can teach people about LDRs. What is a light-dependent resistor? How does it work? How does it interface with the CPU? You can use a little button to switch, uh, say, the LED on and off. Or, since it's Wi-Fi enabled, you could use a Wi-Fi page, a web page, to do the little switching of the RGB LED. I've thrown together some sort of a schematic, but if you want to teach a beginner what to do with a little CPU, this is a great starting point. Without touching a soldering iron, you can learn a lot. You can learn ADCs, you learn inputs, outputs. If you know somebody who wants to get into microcontrollers, this would be my starting point. And of course, the moment everybody was waiting for, here he is, the ESP32 in a Woover, I think, design. So again, like with the ESP8266, this is not a naked chip. This comes as a module. And the little black thing over here on the top, this is the antenna. So again, this is the thing you don't want to have any copper or any material under, under, underneath if you're designing a board for that. And yeah, again, how do I program this little thing? You guessed right, there's an adapter for that. You simply grab this chip. This is a bit more fiddly, like with the 8266. I have to do this off camera, sorry. And there's a little chip snuggling inside the programming adapter. Just like before with the ESP8266, connect USB, and you can program this thing. Breakouts are on the sides, and yeah, this is pretty easy pro to program. If you want to do a layout with that, you simply, you normally find footprints for the different CPU modules here. And you probably only will need this for a initial program because if I would do that on a board, I always include over the air updates. So I can simply do a reprogramming via Wi-Fi. This makes life so much easier. The ESP32 is a pretty versatile CPU. So, um, 
this one here, this little TD Go board, comes with a. This was me unplugging the USB thing and now isn't able to replug this. Of course, comes with a full color OLED display. Really nice. Lots of these pins are broken out, so this should be pretty easy to build your application around this that needs a little display. No need to have a separate display there if you're fine with the size. Well, this isn't ginormous, but to show some info or do some, like this, scan some Wi-Fi's here, this is pretty neat. If you don't need a color display and just want to show some information like this one just over here, this is an ESP32 with an OLED display in black-white. Well, and it doesn't flicker in real life, believe me. Well, didn't we see this thing before? Isn't this the Wemos D1 thing? In a way, this is like the Wemos D1 thing, and it has more pins, because ESP32 has more pins. So you can see this has two pin rows over here, and I think it's somewhat compatible with the ESP82's Wemos D1 thing. Like with the Wemos D1, this has a lot of ecosystem around it, I haven't some here, we didn't play around with as much, but you could get sensors or actors on, on different PCBs for this too. And this over here is one of my failed projects. Yeah, I have failed projects, yeah, I do. This is an ESP32 with an e-paper display. E-papers, you know them from probably your e-book readers, um, are great when it comes to um, power consumption, but this is only half the thing. E-papers are readable in direct sunlight. This is the thing we learned the hard way when I was working at the university because we were building stuff to use outside. And you were standing outside with a perfectly good readable OLED display that in the lab works great. And you're standing outside and you can't read a thing. This is why we switched to e-paper displays in a bunch of projects here. This little board over here comes directly with the e-paper display. And on the back side, let me see if I can turn this around without breaking everything over here. And on the back side, you see the little CPU, some charging circuit, because you can run it from uh, batteries. I think it has a solar input somewhere on, on the top left. There's a little ba there's the little antenna. And uh, yeah, this worked pretty nice, except for one thing. The refresh rate isn't great. And if you're doing partial refreshes here and you can't do a real refresh, after, say, 12 hours or something, the display gets really garbled. If you have values that changes really slow, say a temperature thing that you update every 15 minutes or something, this would be a great thing to use for that. One of the really, really brilliant boards I know is this one from LilyGo. It has the usual ESP32. Uh, on the back side, it has a battery holder. So it's for a LiPo and 18650. Then you can connect a solar panel. Yeah, you can. It charges the battery then. And you have a module over here. This is a modem. This is a SIM 7000 in the G version. So G for global. You can use this with a GSM modem anywhere on the planet. I think this thing does 5G. I'm not sure with that. This is where the little SIM card goes. We use these ones as for measurement stations that live around the Telde over here on Tenerife. And um, they measure CO2 and some other gases that I can't remember off the top of my head. And they use the GSM modem to put their data on a server. And um, yeah, these boards are not cheap. This goes for about 44 euros or something. But they are great to work with. This is a great construction here. There is no power problems here. You normally have somewhere you go for these modems. They can draw hefty amounts of power. But this is when you drop in simply a, a LiPo on the backside. This takes all your power, power problems away. This is a port for a microSD card. So if you want to put your data onto a microSD card, you can do this directly on the board here. Really, really great design. Last but not least for the ESP32s comes this strange thing over here. You find a VGA port. We have some keyboard and mouse ports, the old ones, you know, serial. And on the back side, there's an ESP32 and an SD card. This, my friends, can emulate, say, a VIC-20. Yeah, and they do this with a... ESP32. I would have shown this on the channel, but I'm missing out a monitor that can do analog VGA and uh, some conversion things over there. 
this is still on the table, but uh, I, I need to figure out how to do the grabbing of the VGA signal first. So give me some time for that. But this is a really strange thing, right? And of course, this video won't be completed without a RP2040. Yeah, this is the microchip uh, version of the Raspberry thing, magic. Let me tell you, get right from the get-go, and you probably will hate me for that. Too late, too less, and not my thing, not really. Uh, they try to get it to a form factor like a nano, but this would be way too big for me, what I'm normally doing. And I would probably stick with these little ones. I'd simply put them on here. This one is a tiny 2040, and the other is a 2040 RP2040. Of course, there's something different here. And um, some have an LED, some don't have. This is all the same CPU. Um, you can program these in the Arduino ID too. Yeah, I know. But um, not a big fan. Not really. So I'll leave this in here just to show that they exist. And please don't ask me to do a project with them. Please, please, please. Pretty please. So if I need something with a bit more oomph, like I say in Arduino Uno, and I don't want to go the Raspberry way, this is normally what I go for. Seed Studios, Shows, and I probably say this wrong, but this is a really nice one. This is based on an ARM Cortex with 133 MHz. It has DACs on board and that are really, really good and really fast. It has a lot of ADCs, really versatile CPU. The only downside, no Wi-Fi. But if your project doesn't need Wi-Fi and you need something with a bit more kick like an Arduino Nano, this is the way to go for me. They are even expanding this fam family. This is a little one, another is Chao, but this Chao has an NRF something 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 chip on there. Haven't played around with them, could be interesting. This is, I think, a very low power application then. But, um, well, I need more time for that and I don't have this in right now. So, this is in the pipe. So this was a little tour through all these CPUs and module boards I have laying around. Believe me, it looks like a bomb exploded around me. Everywhere are CPU boards right now. I have to clean up now and um, I'm leaving you with this nice picture of the Uno, the grandfather, grand-grandfather of all of them. And uh, thanks to Arduino again for doing this for us, to bringing microcontrollers to the people. Well, as always, I hope you learned something. Don't forget to comment about which CPU you want to know more about, because this was a very, very brief look around. And we could go in depth with that, but let me know what you want to do. Okay, I see you around in the next video. Bye.